here he is joining us from uh, his home is the great Eddie Alvarez, the underground king, wearing the Eagles shirt. Sorry about the loss on Sunday. Did that bother you more? Did the Eagles loss on Sunday bother you more than the Saturday fight? No. Okay. No. Just yeah, you don't have. <laughs> enough of that enough of that Eric. okay sorry 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 uh you beat my bills two weeks ago so i'm a little salty uh how are you doing eddie how are you feeling after that that was incredible to watch but gruesome from from an outsider's perspective how are you feeling uh much better today um the night of the fight was rough like we uh so suffered uh that two like a multiple fracture like i had an old fracture um from the gilbert melendez fight wow uh, of of my orbital that refractured during that during that fight, and uh, so it was that it was a kind of like on the side here where my nose where my nose is at, and then one down here. So like it was like a two fractures that happened, and kind of somewhere like maybe like halfway through the second halfway through the second round, kind of felt it felt my kind of vision sort of uh, going little by little. And then, uh, when I sat at the store, I pretty much, I felt that same feeling before I knew, I knew what was what and knew what was happening to my eye. So, um, yeah, it was rough. Uh, it was rough. Can you describe what that feeling is like? What, what, like, what does that actually feel like? What are you experiencing? Yeah. So, um, when I fought Chad, I lost, kind of lost my vision for about 20 seconds Damn. during the Chad fight, but, um, very different. Uh, when I fought Chad, I got blood in my eye and I couldn't see him. And I just breathed my way through it, got through, got through it. And then within 20 seconds, it all came clear. So I knew it was just blood. I'm like, okay, it was just blood that was in my eye. And now it's gone. Now I could see clear again. This was sort of a slowly just losing it. Ooh. Like as the time was going, each entrance, each combination that was being thrown, slowly losing my, uh, like my depth. I couldn't really see them. And then you can even see during the second, um, maybe I start to get a little wider with my punches, a little more desperate because I just, I can't really see them as well. My like during, during the fight. So as I sat at the stool, I'm like, yeah, my nose, uh, same thing that happened in the, um, Gil Melendez fight, my nose starts leaking. So, uh, there's a, once there's a little crack in the nose and the, the orbital, the sinus starts to go. So like, that started to calm down. It all started to feel familiar again. Like, Sheesh. and um, you you can't fuck with the orbital. It's really really bad injury. If um, it could go really bad really fast. So um, I'm lucky. I got I got the corner. I do. I, I have the experience in my corner with with Mark Henry, Ray Robinson, myself. We have between the three of us, we have decades of experience and. You gotta know. You gotta know um, when the hunt is over, <laughs> and the hunt was over. And uh, even the greatest predators got to bow on a hunt here and there because it's just not your night. You know what I mean? So, unfortunately, that's what it was. I felt fucking amazing. I felt incredible. I was prepared. I was ready. Um, our game plan was was exactly what you guys seen from the very beginning. And that was what I was hoping to do for, you know, five rounds. But uh, unfortunately, that's the game we're in. So just a few follow-ups. Uh, just be, I was going to ask you, just because you're 100% okay with the stoppage, right? There was no, even in the moment, you were okay with it? Yeah, I know. We knew. Like, collectively, it was sort of like, this is terrible because, like, we got, had such a great, great start. Yeah. Like, it was, it was like not rarely does a fight go the way you plan it, right? You plan it, and it's like okay, it, you know, you don't you don't know what could happen in between. But it was going like we knew we were going to be faster. Um, there was a possibility of me catching him. All this was talked about, and it was going like exactly the way we spoke about it, almost too good. And then, boom, you know, uh, that's. That's what she wrote. And I was like, damn, man. What do you think happens if you don't break the orbital? How do you think it plays out? Oh, I, I, had, I had him nearly knocked out in the first round. I, I, again, catching him in the second round. 
sooner or later, I mean, that shit adds up. So one of us were going to damage the other one. Right. He got me first. You know what I mean? And that, like, that damage, that's bare knuckle. You know what I mean? Like, you, that's the beauty of that game is you could be damn perfect, but damn near perfect. But one guy's going to damage the other one before, you know, you got to, you got to get there first. You got to do the damage first. That's, and that's like a street fight. Street fight's the same way. The guy, who, the guy who usually punches first in a street fight typically wins. So like bare knuckles, a different sport. It's not like anything else. Mm. It's not like anything else I ever did. It's unique in itself. Now that you've done it twice, do you enjoy it? I do. I do. <laughs> I enjoy it because there's so many, there's so many, there's so many nuances that like don't have to do with MMA, have nothing to do with MMA. And um the training is different and the recovery is different. It's a different speed and pace. Um tactically, you have to be, you have to change. You know, it fits some guys. Don't fit everyone, but it fits some fighters. Do you enjoy it more and, than MMA um, at this point? At this point, yeah, I do. Why? Yeah, at this point. Um, one, I think, and, and I think it's less, I think it's less damaging than MMA, like a lot less. Um, uh, because in MMA, you could train for a fight, you know, the training camps are two, three months, and a lot of them two, three months, you're um, grappling, wrestling, kicking. The There's such a demand in MMA and what you put your body through, almost never do you know. You, you don't know as an MMA fighter. It's very uncertain whether you're going to make it to the fight. So, like, you're always playing this game of, I have to take a risk during my camp in order to be prepared, but how much risk do I take? Mm. And it's, it's, it's a balance. It's like a fine balance. In this, almost every time you're going to make it to the fight. You know, it's, it's not a lot less wear and tear. You can train more. You can recover better. Um, I think it's just all together, all together better. Two minute rounds, one minute rest. Mm. So the ratio to work the rest is a lot better. Um, yeah, I just think you have more control of making it to a fight, of actually making it to a fight. You spar leading up to these fights? Yeah, how, with gloves. With gloves. Like boxing. How how big are the gloves? 16 ounce like a box like a pro box the okay. same way a pro boxer would do their camp i'm doing mine sort of the same way except um usually at the end of our at the end of our sessions we're doing clinch work uh. we're like we're adding clinch work and then whenever i do mitts noodles bag work that kind of stuff we take the gloves off so we can get the timing okay you want to get the timing of having bare hands because it's a lot different having a 16 ounce glove. You take that off, the the timing is a lot different. So that's exactly most of the why stuff I asked. There, yeah, okay, that's what I was wondering. Even when you hit mitts, it's bare. Bare, yeah. Bare. Damn, yeah. That doesn't mess I may, up. Sometimes I'll put on uh, wraps mm. if I if I get open openings in my knuckles. So like, you'll see sometimes yeah. you'll get an opening and it's annoying and you don't want to get staff and shit. So. Um, sometimes I'll wrap that up just so I don't get no infection or anything, but mostly I just keep it like that to strengthen my wrist, my ligaments, um, to strengthen it all. So when you go to hit, everything's good and strong. Because you have found this new life in bare knuckle and the debut went so well and the, the first round went so well and, and to a degree, the second round went so well, how hard of a pill is this to swallow this particular loss? Um, I, look, I, I had a long flight back home, right? I had like five hour flight back home thinking about like, okay. And I do this is every fight I lose. And I, and I kind of write notes in my, in my phone of what could be done different, right? Like if we could do anything, what would, would we have done to change the outcome of the fight? And a lot of times that the things that need to be changed happen inside of the camp or way before the actual fight happened. And I think um, if I could change a couple things, I think I maybe I gave up a little bit too much size and weight. Um, 
I, I would change that. I would try to get it at a little bit. Uh, I try to maybe do it at 65 or something like that. Make, make him come down a little bit. So like I did give up size. Like I, yeah. I, I'll agree. I'll agree with the audience. Like I gave up size. Um, and I was okay with that. Cause I still thought I would put Mike Perry away to this day. I still feel like I could put Mike Perry away. I gave up a little bit too much size. I would have did that differently. Um, The fight itself, um, you know, I, I got caught with a big shot. It's like it's bare knuckle. I don't I I love the way I fought. I wanted to put him away. I wanted to land my shots. I didn't want to run from him. I wanted to meet him right in the middle of his shots. And same way you would you would meet someone like Justin Gates here, meet a meet a guy who has that forward pressure. I wanted to punch with him. And, and hit in between and eventually knock him out. That's what we tried to do. We took, we took risks that way. And I was okay with that. Mm. Um, and I almost did. I don't know. He, he got really wobbled. We hurt him really bad, really early. Maybe I should have got on him. Uh, I should have got on him more rather than relax too much after I hurt him, but just maybe some small little adjustments, but um, I can't do anything about a broken orbital and I, and I can't fight with one because if I fight with one, I can never fight again. And I can never, I can lose my vision. I can't see my kids smile. You know, there's, not, there, there's nothing I could do about that. So like, I don't regret take, not taking the risk of losing my vision. Yeah, of course. So I thought, and I thought long and hard about that. And I can't regret that. So there's not many things I could have done differently. My coach is prepared well. Coach Mark Henry's was amazing. Coach Ray Robinson was amazing. We were ready. My sparring partners were amazing. Um, just one of them things, man. We're in, we're in fighting. We fist fight, and it's unpredictable. Spoke to him earlier this week, and he was talking about like like as he put it. I'm paraphrasing, but like the jab style of just sort of like hitting him with shots. He's like that. That was nothing, you know. I, I was gonna come on and really put, you know, the pain on him, damage him, as I did later on. And so he was saying, like, the typical boxing style of just using the jab and all that is not gonna work in bare knuckle. You're, you're, you're almost gonna, you're, you're, you know, you're gonna hurt your hand or whatever, and it's not gonna cause the type of damage that you want to cause. Is there any truth to that, in your opinion? Uh, no, 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 because he was all fucked up. I mean, look, look at. <laughs> His face was a mess. I don't, his face was just like almost as bad as mine. So right. like, there is no truth to that. No, because look, one, one good jab, right? One solid jab cuts, cuts in the wrong spot. The fight's over. Mm. So like to say that a jab is ineffective is silly. Cause like, well, I'm cut pretty good right here. I think he was maybe cut there, but like this gets open enough. It ain't up to you. The ref's going to say, or the judge are going to say, hey, it's over. Mm -hmm. That blood keeps getting in your eyes. So, like, the jab's the best punch in bare knuckle. There is no better punch in bare knuckle than the jab. Um, and I was I was jabbing well. I think I think he was, I think he was trying to pitch a shutout, and he kept saying the entire camp, easy work, mm -hmm. light work, easy work, and it fucking wasn't. And you know, it wasn't. It was a the furthest thing from easy work. And, uh, it was, it, I think the same thing I said before this camp, I think it's at a certain point, um, maybe he's going to not, he's going to think like, this is not going to be easy work. And I think after the first round, him and his coaches, you could see not the panic in him, but him and his coaches were like, Hey, you can't stand in front of him. Hmm. You can't like, you know, they were almost like, hey, you need to make some adjustments here because this is not going well. Why do you think Mike has found so much success in bare knuckle? Uh, I think Mike's success in bare knuckle has to do with his, I mean, his durability and his, I mean, he, he's hard to put down. Um, he's a hard guy to put down. Like, it's going to be hard to even get a stand eight against him. He's a, he's, he's a battle axe. And he's like a fucking zombie. It's like, 
I, I, the shots I hit him with, you know, with a bare fist, almost a hundred percent of the time put most guys down, but that's, that's why I also think that maybe I gave up too much weight because mm. in my weight class, that same left hook is putting any 65 or 55 or down for sure. And, uh, he was able to stay on his feet with it. Um, but it's his durability and his willingness to, you know, go out on the shield, like, and a lot of bare knuckles, a lot, a lot about that because you're going to take damage 100%. I don't care how skilled you are, how good you are. And that's got to be a part of the game, a part of the game in bare knuckle. Unlike a lot of these other sports is, can you take damage and keep a good positive attitude and keep coming forward as if it's not happening to you, you know? Um, and he could do that. He could do that with the best of them. By the way, speaking of the weight, um, at the weigh-ins, I think you were saying like your manager messed up and he was complaining about something. What, what was that all about? You don't miss a fucking beat, man. Bro, I mean, <laughs> it was great shit. It was great. I loved yeah. it. It was good drama. No, but that was that, that was said between me and him. I don't think anybody asked that. Y'all know – I don't know if you had some kind of sonar in there. No, <laughs> it was all they, they. It was in the face-off. You you said to him, "You're." It was in the clip. I just. I will not. All right. So. Yes. Um, all right. So at weigh-ins, our weight was one seventy-six, one seventy-five and a pound, right? So, I weighed in at one seventy-five point seven, which I'm on weight. Yeah. 175 and a pound. No problem. Well, I get off the scale and we, both of our guys send someone to watch the other guy weigh in. Well, his coach turns to Mike's manager and says, Hey, he's, he's, he's not on weight. He's a, he's 0.7 over. And I went, no, we're, we're on weight, man. And it's 176 is the, is the weight. And they didn't know that. Mm. Mike's manager messed up. And told Mike that you're not getting a pound. So they made Mike cut a whole other pound that he didn't need to cut. Mm. Which Mike's already big and he's already cutting. And that's a massive, I mean, that's a massive fuck up. Like me and Lloyd, me and my manager, Lloyd's excellent, by the way. And that would never happen in my camp. But um, I would fucking be furious because the last the hard, the hardest pound to cut is the last pound, mm -hmm. and, and they made him cut one beyond that. Mm. So, um, you know that could put you at a really bad disadvantage if, if you're already cutting a lot. So, they had him cut a pound that he should never cut, and then instead of just being like we fucked up, we fucked up, they said no, Eddie is overweight, and I'm like no, I'm not, and we put up the contracts right there. Oh wow! On my phone, <laughs> I showed him the contract for the fight and said. Here's the contract. Once they're and they got, oh, okay. But they still argued it. They still kept arguing. I'm like, there's nothing to argue about. The bad agreement's right here. Right, so. right. Okay. Um, that is good stuff. Uh, I was on wait. I mean, for the record. Yeah, yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, nothing okay. happened. Um, are you going to fight again? Uh, I'm, I'm hearing rumblings of Philadelphia. And, and if, if that happens, I mean, I got it. We got it. We got to make that happen. And you're talking we about BKFC in Philly. So I hope so. So I, I heard uh, David Feldman at the post fight press conference say Philadelphia in the works potentially. And he said he would love to run it back. And I think you implied on Twitter you'd love to run it back. I asked Mike about this yesterday, and he doesn't seem all that keen on, on running it back, if only because he was worried about, you know, maybe you'll need a lot of time. Uh, because of the eye to to heal up. But even when he was on my show on Monday, he was talking Masvidal, he was talking Pettis, you know, names like that. Do you think that he is not interested in running it back? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I need him to say yes, right? I just know. <laughs> I mean, I could I could want it to happen all day, but we need we need him to say yes in order for the fight to happen. So would that be your, um, your ideal good. scenario? Him in Philly? Um Philadelphia, yeah. Philadelphia. But him in Philly, like do you do you want him to be a part of that equation or or do you not care as long as it's in Philly? 
It honestly, that would be the that would be the best case scenario. Um, my, myself, um, I would like to get a low. I would like to get to more of a natural weight. Mm. Did you see me? Like that's not me. Like, yeah, yeah. See my body. Yeah, that's not my body. Like I had it. I'm like kind of fat. Like I, had to, I had to like hold on to weight that I didn't want to hold on to, and be bigger than I wanted to be in order to fight at a weight that's not my weight. So I took, I look, I took a fucking shot, man. And I believe, I believe, I really, me, my coaches, everyone around believed that we can make this happen. And we just, fucking we didn't. So like, it is what it is, but um, no ideal in a perfect world. I want to be at 65. I want to fight at my natural weight. Um, It'd be lovely to get a rematch with him. I'm, something more of my natural weight if we can meet somewhere in between um that would be the ideal situation but for me i don't want to i don't even want to come in a fight week like in that like my body fat was much higher than it ever was and i i, I hate that i want to come in fight week like ripped up shredded feeling like I didn't even feel like that was my body fight week. I'm like, this is not the body I even fight in, you know? If you get Philly, that feels like the perp like, is that, is that, is that the retirement fight? Oh, uh, we don't, we don't talk. We don't say the R word around okay, here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Our, uh, sorry. The last sorry, one. That's the quitter. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> it just, it just feels like the storybook <laughs> ending, right? Oh, maybe so. Who knows? Right. Maybe you should show up there. Maybe you should be there. Uh, maybe I will. Maybe I will. You played this game on me last time, and I did show up in Kensington. Don't forget. I showed up. Yeah. We walked the streets. Yeah, you did. That was something. I'll never forget that one. Maybe, that was incredible. Holy smokes. Maybe maybe we walk Kensington before before the Philly fight one more time. All right. Sounds good. Um, just two more to ask you about. Uh, now that you've been a part of the BK, you know, seen and an and operation and the machine. Um, I, I've seen the interviews with David Feldman. It seems like they're on a bit of a roll here. Do you feel like they could be a legit player in this combat sports world where they're no longer like the freak show sideshow thing, like a real, you know, that, that, that crowd and that gate on Saturday, that was impressive. Like, do you feel, yes. Uh, do I feel, do I feel, I mean, there's still some states, tell me what, there's still some states that don't oh. allow it, right? Some major states, Nevada, California, I think some might be coming, but like, yeah, they're coming. They're coming. All right, all right. They're coming. Look, 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 we just sold out. Like, who else did what we did? Who else? PFL, Bellator. Right. Who else? Who? Who did what we just did? Yeah. Like, who did what Bare Knuckle just did? We just sold out the Maverick. Uh, maybe ten thousand people deep. Everyone was going bananas, and the whole world watched the fight. I mean. I, I'm online right now. They just posted the Chad Mendes fight like five days ago. It has already over a million views. Yeah, no, the views for this fight that, going into it was nuts. Um, Nobody was watching anything else but me and Mike Perry. UFC was on, but nobody, like, everybody watched me and Mike Perry. Like, then, there, it's not, it's not a, it's, I don't think it's a question anymore about bare knuckle. And they can, they can do an event for damn sure. Um, they can sell out a live event. They've already proven that. And now they can get the whole world to watch. It's like, what else do you need? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what else you need. Um, the game set, the, the, the pins are set up. It's like, I don't, I'm excited. I'm super excited for the future. I think it's going to be, I think, look, UFC is the 500 pound gorilla. Bjorn Redney used the call, right? Um, it's a 500 pound gorilla and they ran so fast, so quick. No one's really going to catch up to that. Right. But you don't have to catch up to that. If you're not playing the same game they're playing, like this is a whole different base. There's a whole different sport you would say, but like everything about it is different. Yeah. Everything. I can speak first person point of view. Like everything's yeah, different no. about bear. You know what I mean? You more than anyone. I mean, you, you've pretty much fought for every single organization except for PFL at this point. Just curious. I, lo I always love your take on the business. PFL acquiring Bellator. Your thoughts? I think there, I think what other play is there, right? 
Like I know Dana says, uh, one one company who doesn't sell tickets buying enough. Well, why not acquire that? Um, I think the assets alone, like or assets or fighters, you want to call them alone in Bellator. I don't know what they bought it for. What was the what was the amount they bought it for? Zero, just equity. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Like, look at look at you got you got McKee, you got the uh, Pitbull brothers, you got Corey Anderson, you got there's there's enough assets and fighters and great contracts that it's worth it for free. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a great price for for them fighters and for that content. So. I agree. Chandler Connor. <laughs> I, I do, he's, me and you dealt with this with Connor, right? <laughs> right? I don't know what like, you are mean. We to, are we allowed to tell the audience that, Ariel? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know. Tell no. Me. Whoa, what? We oh, we can't tell the audience? Go like, ahead. Nobody tell had me. any clue <laughs> if I was fighting or when I was fighting. And we're all just trying to figure it out. <laughs> Until like the day before the presser. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a crazy Until, time. Until, yeah. Now I get, yeah. Now I get a call, you know, from the boss himself. Oh, you found out. Oh, yeah, we found out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we found out. We're, we found out when we're fighting and who we're. So you know what's crazy about that. Same, you know what's crazy about that. Thing. Yeah, Habib what? got so mad at me. There's a clip of us because I told I, I've seen it. I was telling him that he was being used as a pawn because of what they were doing, and I knew what was going on. And this guy blocked me and got mad at me, and I was trying to help him out. I was trying to help a brother out, and he got mad at me for that because he said that I wasn't telling the truth. When in reality, I was telling the truth because they were trying to do you versus him and using him as the, you know, as the as the chip. Like, hey, if if, if you don't take this fight for this price, we're just gonna go with Khabib. You remember all that? Yes, and that's that's their play, right? The, right? Their play is if we can get, we can't just have two guys involved and know that they're going to fight each other. Because if they know that, now they have leverage to say, "Hey, I want this much. I want this." So they always get a third or fourth or fifth guy involved yeah. to beat your price down to nothing. <laughs> so, um, I think that's what's going on, right? Because if Mike Chandler knows he's fighting Connor and Connor knows he's fighting Chandler. Then the two have room to negotiate for that fight itself. So I think a third or fourth or fifth player is coming along that we didn't hear about yet. So they both get beat down to nothing. Not beat down to nothing, but it. so they both don't try to negotiate a dollar over what their contract's worth. That's what's going on. Um that and Connor, he, you know, he holds the cards and he gets to say when it happens. And it, if look, if I'm Connor. I'm not telling my opponent when I'm fighting him either. If I don't fucking have to, right? Like I'll I'll let I'll let them know when when it's when I feel like it's when I feel like it's my time to let them know. Man, fascinating times in the biz. A lot of these numbers are coming out now because the company is public. I don't know if you saw some of these yesterday. Twenty five million dollar site fee from Saudi Arabia. Twenty million from Abu Dhabi just to put on the event. In addition to all the other money that they're getting, twenty five million. 200,000, 200 million, excuse me, in sponsorship right now from 60 million in 2016 to 200 million. Uh, pfft, like they are, they are on fire. Wow. Hey, I want to bring this up to you because I know this was interesting to you. Um, did you see that email, what they were doing to Nate? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, my God. This, is, dirty, a, this is it. For those that don't know, this is an email that's come out. Uh, there's a great reporter named John Nash who's getting all of this out because of the class action lawsuit where Joe Silva is saying essentially like, if he doesn't take this fight, we're going to bury him on the prelims against a really tough guy on his way out, which is essentially what they did to him with Hamzat, except Hamzat missed weight and it didn't work out. But this is, this is what this has been going on. Do you remember Andre Arlovsky back in the day? They put him on the prelims against Jake O'Brien because he couldn't come to terms. He was going to go to affliction. This has been going on for years. It's just the fight business, yeah, right? But that, that, that's the sport. And that, that's important for the up and coming fighter who wants to be in this business for them to understand that, like if you're not cooperative, what the conversation is in the boardroom, if you're not cooperative and yeah. they're the real conversations that are being had about you, the fighter 
who's signing these contracts if if you don't cooperate. So like I dealt with this with Bellator. I knew that they were trying to kill me off the minute I didn't want to stay. And when you don't want to stay and you don't want to cooperate, the next thing is how do we get him beat? How do we devalue him to a point where he can't fight for anyone else but us? And that that's just the sport. And them emails reveal it so like it's so like boom right Black in your and face white. like yeah and we it's talked about and you know I guess it's conspiracy theory but now we see it like oh wow well, this is how they speak about us when we're not around crazy what a sport and you have uh, survived it all and then some and now thriving in in bare knuckle thank you for doing this uh, get well soon. And uh, we'll see you in Philly in 2024. I'll see you guys. How All are right. you? Thanks. There he is, Eddie Alvarez, or as uh, Bjorn Rebney liked to call him back in the day, Ed Alvarez. Great stuff from him. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it very much. Hey, if you like this video, give us the old thumbs up. Subscribe as well. You can get many more of these videos on the channel. So please do that. We would love you forever if you did so.